All right, so just want to welcome everybody in person and online. Um, watching online, I know we're running a little bit late, but one of the things we have decided to do is when the Lord is moving in our worship is we might sometimes not start online exactly at 11. So, you know, I just want to let you know that. And so the Lord was moving today in a very powerful, prophetic way. So that is why we are a little bit late. So uh, one quick announcement in case you're, you don't know this, we, we do have the privilege of having Terry Bennett come and Josiah Bennett come um, August the 26th to the 28th. They're going to be doing a three-day conference Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, we're going to be live streaming that, of course. It'll be the, if, you, uh, um, if you are subscribed to our email list, you have the details about that. But I uh, just want to encourage you to be here. I want to encourage you to watch it online if you live, live out of the country and can't make it. So anyway, just wanted to make sure I made that announcement. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 13, verse 34. And I'm continuing in the theme of the message that we've been on 50 lessons for uh, 50 years where I'm giving things I would say, you know, I would... I. I started this saying, I, I love, I always love hearing those blog posts or videos or whatever when people say, hey, what would you tell your 25 year old self? Um, you know, now that you're older, what would you say? What advice you would give? And I love doing that. This message is, we're continuing that theme, but this message is a little bit different because this, these are lessons that I feel like I don't have myself. I know they're true now at the age of 50. But I feel like God is still doing a work in me in this. So this is not like things I would tell my 50-year-old self. These are things I would tell myself right now. My 25-year-old my self, these are what I would tell myself right now. I desperately need this word today about love, loving others. And uh, I have this workout video that I follow. And whenever the guy gets to what he calls Cuban presses, where you do the shoulder presses like this, he always... Right, well, he, he did it once, but I hear it all the time because I listen to it two or three times a week. He says, okay, this one's going to burn. <laughs> and sure enough, by the time you're done doing the Cuban presses, your shoulders are really burning. That's the way I feel about this message. This one's really going to burn, and I feel like it's going to burn me more than it's probably going to burn a lot of you because, and you're probably going to be like, yeah, amen. Uh, just, just the need for loving others like Jesus loves us. And so this one is going to burn. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, verse 34. And the Lord is talking to the disciples. And, and, and you, uh, it's, it's a passage of Scripture, John 13, through about John 17, where the Lord is preparing them for his departure. And he makes some of the most profound statements in this passage of Scripture. I love this passage of Scripture. But in, verse, in John 13, verse 34... The Lord is, is speaking and he's, he's giving them a new commandment. Listen, listen to what the Lord told his disciples. He said, a new commandment I give to you. The Lord's giving them a new commandment. That you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Raise your hand if you've mastered that. Oh, good, Howard, that's awesome. Come teach me. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, uh, I mean, how many of you realize, okay, this, this challenge to love others like Jesus has loved us is not easy, is it? I mean, it's super challenging to love people the way Jesus has loved us. Now, I, wanted, I want us to turn to John chapter 15, a couple chapters over, because the Lord essentially says the same thing. John 15, verse 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So here the Lord is speaking to us, and it sounds a lot like it's the second commandment, doesn't it? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But it's actually not the second commandment. Even though it's similar, and even though I would categorize it under the label of second commandment, 
is actually a new commandment. And the Lord says that I'm giving you a new commandment that you would love one another. Who is one another? It's not the world. It's his people. Okay, this doesn't mean we don't love the world. We do love the world. But there is a greater love we're meant to express within the church body, the family, the ecclesia of God, is that we love one another. So Jesus was telling his disciples, love one another. He's looking at his disciples gathered together. He's love one another. He's not talking about the love we exhibit to the world. He's talking about the love we exhibit within the church, within the realm of God's people. And he doesn't say, love them like you love yourself. He says, love them as I have loved you. So we're talking about supernatural love. We're not talking about human love right now. We're talking about the, the Spirit of God empowering us to love others like Jesus has loved us. And if we don't experience Jesus' love for us, it is impossible to love others, to love one another without that love. So it flows out of our, our love experience with Jesus Christ. But just to make things simple in this message, I am going to say the second commandment in the, in the new covenant, the second commandment ex both is loving one another, loving God's people with the love of Jesus, and it's also loving our neighbor, the world, as we love ourselves. That is the second commandment. And so as we get into this continuation of 50 lessons, as we talk about the second commandment is, you know, as we talk about this, I want to say a couple truths right up front, just so you understand a little bit of where I'm coming from, is if the second commandment takes the place of the first commandment, you will burn out. If the second commandment takes the place of the first commandment, you will burn out. If the second commandment, the second commandment must, number two, the second commandment must overflow out of the first commandment or you will burn out. See, if we try to love others like Jesus has loved us without having that first commandment solidly established in our lives, we will burn out. We will burn out. So this has to flow out of the first commandment. The second commandment must flow out of the first commandment. Number three is you are called to love others with God's love, not just your own human love. This is a supernatural, divine love that is not human love. It's not soulish love. It's not human compassion. It's the love of Jesus Christ in us flowing out of us to others. Number four, is a lot of times I hear Christians saying, I've said it myself, well, I just need, man, I just need God to give me more love. I just need God to give me more love. I just need more love. God, give me more love. And the Lord's like, you already have all the love you need is in you. See, for, it's either, it's in Peter, first or second Peter, is you have everything pertaining to life and godliness right now. All the love you need to fulfill the first commandment and the second commandment is in you because the indwelling Holy Spirit is inside of you. You have all the love you need to love others as Jesus has loved you. You have all that love inside of you already because the indwelling Holy Spirit lives inside of you. What you need is to learn how to release that love to love others. And number five is do for some what you would love to do for everyone. Okay, so it, it, when we talk about the second commandment, a lot of times people go like, oh God, this sounds impossible to lay down my life for everyone. And like the Lord's not calling you to lay down your life for everyone, but he is calling you to sacrifice yourself for some. You can't do everything for everybody or you, you're not superhuman. <laughs> you have limited time, limited energy, a limited schedule, limited capacity so you can't do for everyone what you would love to do, but you can do it for some. And so when we talk about the second commandment, you got to realize these five things because otherwise when you hear this, you'll be like, oh, I can never do this. 
The Lord's not calling you to love everyone with a laid down life the same, but he is calling you to do it for some. And that some is determined by your own relationship with the Lord and how he leads you and who he leads you to do this for. Does that make sense? Okay, so picking up the 50 lessons, we're on number 14, is the question, number 14, the question we will, we will answer when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ is did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? That will be, among other things, but that will be one of the primary evaluations that we will have when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Did you learn to love? You know, uh, Paul was very clear. He says, you all are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to give him an account for the way you lived in the body. Everything that you did by a true motive of love, for love for God, love for people, is going to be tested by fire. And whatever survives that fire, you are going to receive eternal rewards for. On the other hand, everything you do and I do that is motivated by selfish ambition, by being praised by men and women by advancing something for yourself, even in the name of Jesus Christ, is going to be burned at the judgment seat of Christ. Even though you will be saved and even though you will enter into eternity, that which you did that was not motivated by love and what I did that's not motivated by love will burn at the judgment seat of Christ. That's pretty terrifying, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's pretty like, oh my gosh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a startling, terrifying reality. That's why Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord. The, it, it, I hear some people talk about the judgment seat of Christ like it's not going to be that bad. It, if you are not living by the Spirit of God, it's not going to be a fun time. <laughs> but you have the time right now to make changes. And actually, John said something so amazing that I want you to see in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Turn there. And John's talking about the judgment seat of Christ, and he actually makes a statement that at first glance you're like, wow, that almost seems like what Paul was contradicting or what, what Paul said. But, but in 1 John 4, verse 16... John says that we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This is what he says, by this, love is perfected with us. In other words, what, what John is saying is that if you abide in the love of God, and you live out of the love of God, his love for you received and turn back to him. You experience his love, you give love back to him, and from the overflow of that love, you love others. Listen to what John says. He says, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. See, on the one hand, we do fear the judgment seat of Christ. On the other hand, John says you can have confidence in that day of judgment. How? By learning to love. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we get tested. That's where we realize how far we fall short, isn't it? That's where we realize how selfish we are. Is our life is meant to teach us, among many other things, but one of the very top things is, did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? And not just with human love, with the love of Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a famous uh, story that Jerome, the, the famous church father who died in um, 420 A.D., he talked about John the Beloved. And he said John the Beloved in his old age would come to the church of Ephesus. And they could barely get him in because he was aged. He was probably in his 90s or so, and they would bring him in. And all John would say to the church is, little children, love one another. I mean, this is John the Revelator. This is John the one who leaned his head on the heart of Jesus Christ. This is John who had 
who wrote the book of Revelation, the greatest prophecy in the history of man and women, the history of the world. And John, at the end of his age, was telling the, the, the Lord's people, little children love one another. And he was talking about the new commandment that Jesus had given them in John chapter 13. That you love one another even as I have loved you. See, the question is, did you learn to love? Number 14, the 14th, oh, actually I got my numbers wrong here. Uh, number 15 is you may fail at many things, but love never fails. If you want to be successful, learn to love. You're going to fail at a, at a million things. You're going to fail at many things. Okay, I'm not trying to prophesy over you you're going to be a failure. But I'm just saying, if you try things and you've lived long enough, you know you're going to fail. But if you want to be guaranteed successful 100% of the time, learn to love. You'll never fail in anything if you learn to love. In God's eyes. Not in the world, and not even in the church, but in God's eyes, if you learn to love, you will never fail. See, Paul said that love never fails. If you're, if you're struggling to want to succeed in life, in your relationships, in your work, whatever it is, learn to love with the love of Jesus Christ because you will never fail. Number 15. 16, sorry. My, my numberings are wrong, so if I don't think. Number 16 Love is unoffendable. Raise your hand if you're good about not being offended when people hurt you or say things against you. I'm terrible, okay? All of us are. All of us, when, when someone does something to hurt us or says something to us or criticizes us or finds fault with us, all of us raise up defense mechanisms and we get offended, don't we? All of us do that. We have these natural things to want to defend ourselves. But guess what? The love of God does not get offended. The love of God is unoffendable. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, he said that love is not provoked. When you're walking in the love of God for others, he's, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is, is primarily focused on loving others. When you're walking in the love of God for others, you're not provoked. You're not annoyed. You're not easily angered or hurt by what someone does. See, if you start, I, I, I dread being tested about on this one. I, you know, when you speak, God's like, okay, you really believe that, Brian? I'm going to test you. I'm like, oh, God, what, what, what are you all going to say to me? <clears throat> That's a joke. But, you know, what, how am I going to be tested on this? I know I'm going to be tested. Angie, remind me that I'm being tested. <laughs> Is... If I'm walking in the love of God, I'm not provoked. I don't get angered about it. I don't get offended at it. See, that's the test. If you're, if you're getting offended by what someone does or someone says, it's a clear test you're not walking in God's love. You're walking in the soul. You're living in the soul, not from the spirit. Paul said that... that Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. That word account is a word that means an accounting term that means to write into a ledger. That's one of the meanings, to write into a ledger. In other words, you're, when, when, when someone does something to you, you're not recording it down into a book that's in your mind and you're replaying it over and over and over. This person hurt me. This person did this to me. This person did that to me. See, love does not record the wrongs done to you and replays them in your mind over and over and over. If you are hearing a song on repeat in your mind of what someone did or said to you, even if it was hurtful, then it clearly shows that you're not walking in love. Now, that's not meant to condemn. That's just meant to say, oh, okay, that's the problem. I need to love them with the love of Jesus Christ. 
That's easy, way easier said than done. Way easier to preach about than to live. Now, the Lord was talking about the end times in Matthew 24, and he said, you know, the disciples asked him a question, okay, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And one of the things the Lord said is that many will be offended. Not just a little bit, many. How many realize right now we're living in the time when that is being fulfilled? Offense has gone to an entirely new level of uh, something I've never seen in my lifetime. Everyone is so easily offended. You can't, you know, even as a preacher, it's sometimes so hard to say the right things in this culture we live in because, you know, if you say the wrong little word the wrong way, someone easily is going to get offended and you end up hearing about it. And then I get tested to see if I walk in love and I don't <laughs> most of the time. But we are living in that time when Jesus said many will be offended. That word offended actually means a, a bait trap of an animal. And so when you give into offense, it's like you're being trapped, like an animal is being trapped, like a bear trap. You're being ensnared by offense. And the Lord goes on to say is because lawlessness is going to increase, the love of many is going to grow cold. And that word cold means imperceptibly. You don't even know it. You don't even realize it. That all of a sudden, the, the love you once had for others has cooled. And now it's easy to be cynical and grumpy and old mannish or whatever. You know, get off my lawn, kid. You know, it's so easy just to be easily offended, isn't it? Well, that shows us we're not living from the love of God because love is not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love is not, love does not get offended. Love is unoffendable. Love is unoffendable. Number 17. This is a big one for all of us. Is you will never judge someone into transformation. Why do we think our judgments can bring about transformation in someone. <laughs> we do. I mean, don't we think that? We think that, okay, if we judge them and we speak about them and we say, you got to correct this or correct that, that is going to bring transformation. It never has in history. Judgment from men does not bring transformation. But love does. You will never judge someone into transformation, but you will love someone into change. See, when you are judging someone, you're not loving them. When you're judging someone, that hinders you in your ability to love them. Now, that does not mean we don't speak the truth in love. That does not mean we tolerate sin. That does not mean we turn the other way when someone is violating Scripture. It does not mean that at all. In fact, if you really, really love somebody, you're going to speak the truth and love to them and, and with grace, but you're going to first do what the Lord said to evaluate your own heart. That's what Jesus is getting at in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. He's not saying, some people have taken this and say, okay, well, Christians aren't called to judge. Yes, we are called to judge. We are. There's other scriptures that talk about we're called to judge. What we're not called to do is to judge unrighteously. What we're not called to do is to judge when there's issues in our heart that are affecting our perception. In other words, the Lord is saying, deal honestly with what's in your own heart before you make a judgment against someone else. See, when you're judging or criticizing, I'm just going to use the word criticize because that's a better word, I think, of what the Lord's really getting at. When you're criticizing, when you have a critical spirit on someone, you are not able to love them because you cannot criticize and you cannot love at the same time. Now, criticism and discernment are different, but I'm going to talk about that in a second. But when you're criticizing and you're critical of someone, then you're not able to love them. So you can't love someone or you can't judge someone into transformation but you can love them into change. So let's look at Matthew chapter 7. 
all of us, this strikes home with all of us, okay? Especially if the Lord has given you discernment, because a lot of times discernment can become criticism. So we're going to break down Matthew chapter 7. Okay, and I'm going to use the word criticize instead of judge because there is a place, because Christians have taken this to a wrong thing and say, well, you shouldn't judge someone if someone's walking in sin. Someone's, you know, whatever the sin would be, you know, sexual sin or whatever it would be. It's like, well, you're not called to judge me. That, that is just such garbage. Okay, we are called to speak the truth in love. What we're not called to do is criticize. Okay, so the Lord says, do not judge so you will not be judged. Do not criticize so that you will not be criticized. You will reap what you sow. If you criticize others, you will, you will be criticized. So every time you criticize someone, realize you are storing up for yourself criticism for you. God, help me remember that. Angie, help me to remember that. <laughs> For in the way you criticize, you will be criticized. And by the standard of measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, if you have a very strong critical spirit, you are going to come under a very strong critical spirit towards you. And the very faults that you were meant to deal with yourself be, between you and God will then come directed at you from others who are criticizing you because you were critical of others. And in whatever measure you use to criticize, God will measure it back to you. God help us not to be of a critical spirit. That does not mean we don't need discernment. We do. I'm going to talk about that in a second. The Lord said, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Basically what the Lord is saying is like, you think what you see in someone else is so terrible, but compared to what's in your own heart, it's nothing. It's a little speck when you have a log inside of you. The Lord is basically saying, your perception is being twisted by the heart issues you yourself have. Pride, selfish ambition, jealousy, hurts, wounds, disappointments, whatever it is. And so what, what the Lord is saying, he's not saying don't deal with that, don't speak into that. He's saying, whoa, you are so quick to go and speak to somebody else about their faults and their shortcomings when you haven't yet spent time looking at your own heart. And seeing, okay, my perception is this. What is in my own heart that's causing me to judge and to criticize? That's what the Lord's getting at. He's, he's saying, first, when you, when you go to speak critically of someone, don't do it until you have first examined your own heart. Do I have pride in my heart? Do I have jealousy in my heart? Do I have ambition in my heart? Do I have these things in my heart? Number four, verse four, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. See, the Lord is, is basically saying, okay, you're going to go speak this into someone's life, but how can you speak this into someone's life when there's this big log in you? He says in verse five, he says, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What you think often, not always, what you think often is such a big issue in someone else is often a reflection of the unhealed wounds in your own heart, the, your own pride, your own issues, your own struggles with rejection, your own struggles with offense your own struggles with jealousy and selfishness. Not always, but a lot of times it is. And so the Lord's saying, before you go to speak against or to correct or to speak into someone's life, make sure you have evaluated your own heart and that what you're speaking into someone has been filtered through a clean heart. Because if your heart is impure, your perception is impure. 
So you cannot judge someone into transformation, but you can love them into change. I have seen this so often, so often is people will have issues, they'll have wounds, they'll have rejection, they'll have hurt. And I look at them and all I see is the fruit. I don't go beyond to see the root to realize, oh, they're acting this way is because they didn't have or experience love as a, as a child. They're experiencing this because maybe their father rejected them or abandoned them. They're doing this because maybe love was withheld from them. But yet I and many of us, we look at the fruit and we judge and criticize the, the fruit and we don't look at the root to see, okay, they're struggling with this because of this, this, or that. And the Lord would have us go beyond what we see in the fruit to look at the root and say, what is the condition of your heart? Number 18, is a burning yet. Burning yet? Okay, number 18, if your discernment causes you to reject people, it's not discernment but criticism. See, we need discernment. But if your discernment causes you to reject people, it's not discernment, it's criticism. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the spiritual man discerns all things. When the Holy Spirit inside of you is leader, and your spirit is first, and there's divine order, spirit first, soul second, body third, and the Holy Spirit is strengthening your spirit as a leader, then you in your spirit are going to have intuitive knowledge of certain situations and certain people, you're going to discern what is actually taking place and what is happening. The spiritual person discerns everything. So if you're really led by the Holy Spirit, you're going to discern things about people. You are. You're going to discern they're struggling with this or they're struggling with that because this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. And that's true. That's true. What you're seeing is true because you're spiritual, because the Spirit of God in you is showing you those things. That's discernment. That's needed. That's necessary. That's part of the Spirit-led life. But what easily happens is your discernment causes you to reject them because of what they're doing because you're discerning things instead of loving them and then that discernment becomes criticism instead of love. That doesn't mean we don't need, we, that doesn't mean we shift and we don't have any discernment. No, we, we have discernment. We have insight into what's really happening. We see what's going on. We are accurately discerning, but we don't reject the person for what they're doing or what they're experiencing or the fruit they're producing, we see to the root and we say, okay, how can I love them into transformation? Because judgment will not bring it. Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, he said, this I pray, and I would say, God, help us remember to make this a prayer. This I pray that your love would abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. When you're really walking in, in true spiritual discernment and the Holy Spirit is the leader and your spirit is, the, is first in divine order and the Spirit of God is intuitively giving you that knowledge of precise things that are happening, then if that's really happening, your love for that person is going to abound still more and more and more. Number 19. True love is sacrificial, not superficial. True love is sacrificial, not superficial. I mean, how often, you've been in the church, 
you know, a lot of us have been in this church, so hopefully it's not true in this church, although I'm sure it is to some degree, because we're all human. But how often have we experienced that fake Christian love where we say, I love you, brother, you know, I'll be praying for you, brother, but we never ever pray for him, and all our words are just empty words, right? Love is not superficial. Love is sacrificial. So I want to brag on three people in here today. I want to brag on Heather, Michelle, and Shelly. And I want to say just, you know, Patricia and Bryce just got married. I told them not to listen to this message. I told them not to come to church. So hopefully they're not listening to this message. But I'm just going to say this. And, I'm, and, and when I'm saying this, please, I know a lot of other people help. But I mean, man, the, the sacrifice these three ladies made to make this an incredible wedding was, I was just so impressed by their love and their sacrifice. And I mean, I don't know how much time they spent, but I mean, Heather probably, I, I mean, Heather probably spent, who knows, 12, 15 hours, who knows how many hours, just a ton of hours. And I mean, when you walked into that reception, um, that place looked like the marriage supper of the lamb. I mean, it was beautiful. and so. You know, and then, you know, the, the columns here that Michelle and Shelley did, just, it looked awesome. I mean, it just looks so incredible. And I was just blown away by the sacrifice of these three ladies. Now, again, I know others help, but I'm just pointing there. It, it was the, it was love and demonstration. And so now even John's garage looks like a wedding warehouse. There's like all these wedding supplies in his garage. And, you know, it's like they laid down their lives they laid down their time, they laid down their energy and their schedule to say, I am going to show the love of Jesus Christ to Bryce and Patricia, and I'm going to try to help them have the best wedding they can absolutely have. And I'll tell you this, is when we were at the reception and Patricia was sharing, she was like, she, you could just tell how blown away she was by the demonstration of love from this church. That is what this is all about. The family of God demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ for one another. It was so touching. I mean, you know, maybe I had a little bit of a tear, but maybe I didn't. But um, it was so moving to see, like, you know, how much those acts of love impacted her. A thousand eloquent sermons by dad or myself and, you know, it probably wouldn't be even eloquent if I did it. But a thousand great sermons about love and talking about love could not have made the impact that uh, it did of when three ladies and the rest of the church helping also laid their lives down, their time, their schedule, their energy to see that they had the best wedding they possibly could have. And they were like, we've never experienced this before. This kind of love. And it was so beautiful. I was so, I don't want to say proud because that sounds like I'm up here and you're here. I don't mean that way. I was so impressed. I was so just like, how incredible is that? That, that they felt that kind of love. So thank you for the sacrifice you guys made. That's what I'm talking about. Love is sacrificial, not superficial. Love goes beyond mere words. Be blessed, my friend. Be, you know... I love you, brother, when, you, when you're criticizing them. or you know, Love goes beyond just mere words. It goes into truth. It goes into action. There, there's a scene, if you've seen Chosen, when it's my favorite episode. Um, if you've seen that, that series Chosen, my favorite episode, it was Anna's, the one she didn't like at all, the, the most one she didn't like. But it's the one episode where it's actually kind of a boring episode where Jesus is healing people all day in uh, wherever he was. But he was healing people all day, and the disciples are sitting there, and they're talking, and they're talking back and forth the entire day. They're kind of getting into some debates and competition and all this, and they're arguing with one another and all this. And, you know, the whole day Jesus is, he is, is ministering. He's pouring out. He's pouring out. Love compels him. Love moves him to minister even beyond the natural, you know, he's super now, he's God. But even in his, in his human body, he's, he's beyond the point of exhaustion. And if you've ever done ministry, all day ministry, of pouring out and pouring out and pouring out, I mean, it is a, 
It is an exhaustion that you can't even describe. And so, you know, just pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. He finally gets back to the camp, and they're like, where, where did, you know, where have you been? You know, and there's this arguing going on, and he just finally goes into his tent, barely says a word, and just collapses. That's the love of Jesus Christ for us. Just exhibited in action, laying his life down to bring healing to the sick. Laying his life down so people could experience healing. So love is sacrificial, not superficial. Jesus said that greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. See, that is what love is about. Again, you can't do this for everybody. I mean, if Heather, Michelle, and Shelley were to try to do this for everyone, they would have literally no family and no life. They can't, you can't do this for every single person, but we can do it for some. We can lay our lives down and, and show the love of God to other people. Um, Paul said that, Paul said in Romans 12, 9, he said, don't let your love, love, um, he said, let love be without hypocrisy. That word hypocrisy means to speak from behind a mask. In other words, it was a word used to talk about actors on a, in, in a play is they would put on a mask and they would act out their part. And as Christians, how easy is it to put on our Christian smiley face and just say, be blessed, I love you, I'll be praying for you, and never actually to do it. There's actually never any action behind the words you speak. And Paul's saying, don't love superficially. Love in deed, love in truth. Don't speak from behind a mask. Be real with people. If you say to someone, I'm going to be praying for you, then make sure you pray for them. Otherwise, don't say I'm going to pray for you if you're not going to pray for them. I, I, I mean, a lot of times people say pray for me, and I'm like, okay, if I don't pray for them right then, I'm going to forget. So i got to either just say, okay, I'm going to do it, you know, or, or i, I got to make sure I don't say it because I, be, I don't want to be hypocritical in my love. I don't want to speak from behind a mask. I want my, my words and my actions to be in alignment. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, that obviously doesn't mean you can't speak encouraging words. We, we desperately need encouragement. We desperately need to speak words of encouragement, words to build people up. But they must be real words. They can't be this fake, phony Christian stuff that we do in the church when it's not authentic. We, our love has to be real. Peter, 1 Peter 1.22 um, said that since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere, unhypocritical love, I just put this in parentheses, unhypocritical love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. See, the truth is meant to purify our hearts so that we can love others without a mask. So our love for others can be genuine and can be real. John said, 1 John 3, 18, he said, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed, and truth. See, how easy is it when you get busy and you know as a Christian, okay, I need to show love, I need to love people, I need to demonstrate love for people, but you realize, and again, you, you can't do this for everyone, but you, you, how easy is it just to give some meaningless Christian jargon that expresses love when there's no words or truth in what you say. And again, I don't want anyone not to ever speak words of encouragement, but you know, our work, we do need to speak words of encouragement. We need to speak to people. We need to say to people what we would say to them at their funeral while they're still living. You know, sometimes I'm like, why do we at funerals say all this great stuff about people who are dead and we never tell them about that while they're living? I mean, tell me the logic behind that. 
Instead of like waiting to say great things about people when they're dead, say, say things about them while they're living. But what we say needs to be true. It needs to be true. It needs to be real. Don't love superficially. Love sacrificially. Lay down your life for your brethren. Lay down your life for the, the one another, the ecclesia that God has joined. That this, the church of God, the church is meant to be a family. Now, again, we can't be everything to every person. You know, we all are incredibly busy. I get all of that. But we can do something. We can, wherever, whatever, the way the Lord prompts us or moves us, the, the, the greatest love we should be showing is to the church of God. And again, we still need to love the world. But, but Jesus wants us as the church to love one another. If you look up how many times Paul or the New Testament says, love one another, one another. There's a, there, I don't even know how many there are. There's so many one another passages in Scripture. And, and the church wants us, heaven is, a, is one enormous family. And church is meant to be a snapshot of heaven on earth. The family of God. The family of God. That is what, that's what it's meant to be. We are meant to be a family who loves one another. And then number 20, love is not selfish, but selfless. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, that love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not seek its own. See, when we're seeking our own, our own gain, what we can get out of a relationship, how we can receive, well, I don't know, praise, or how we can gain something, or a connection, or you know, an open door, or whatever it would be in a relationship, we're not walking in love with that person. We're seeking our own. Love does not seek its own. Love seeks the good of the other. I mean, that's the sacrificial, selfless love of God. And we get one life, we get one life to live and to prove our love and to develop as lovers. We get one life to see, did you learn to love? And so a lot of times... You know, we are a prophetic church, and I love the prophetic, and I love the spirit of prophecy, and I love speaking out what God's speaking, and I love the deep mysteries of the Word of God, and I love the book of Revelation and understanding, okay, what is God speaking to the church right now in this hour? What is the Spirit of God saying to the church? I love all of that, but sometimes we, for that, that you know, that eccentric, that, you know, that high mountaintop of revelation, we sometimes exchange what God has called us to, to walk in love, simple love for one another. Again, we need the revelation. We need the mountaintop stuff. But the world is going to know that we are true disciples of Jesus Christ by our love. Listen to what the Lord said, not for them, but for one another. Now that begins in the local church, but it doesn't end in the local church. There's a global church that's far bigger, greater, more denominations than we can fathom. Now, I'm not saying we're going to go be unified with people that we are in you know, sharp disagreement with doctrinally, but we've got to be very careful even how we speak about the larger body of Christ, you know? And that, again, doesn't mean we can't call out false teachers. We can't call out false prophets. We can't call out people because the scriptures did. Paul did. Paul called out people who were teaching in error. So it doesn't mean we don't use their names and speak against them. But we've got to be very careful when we do that that we're not slandering the Lord's church, the Lord's body, the Lord's brothers and sisters. That we're not coming under the ministry of the accuser of the brethren and prophesying what the devil says about them, but we're discerning accurately what God says about them 
and we're speaking what God says. See, you get one life and one life only to prove, did you learn to love? You cannot judge someone into transformation, but you can love them into change. When you, love some, when you judge someone, you can't love them at the same time. And if your discernment has caused you to reject them, it's no longer discernment, but criticism. Love must be, be sacrificial, not superficial. Selfless, not selfish. Jesus said, my new commandment is that you love one another even as I have loved you so that all men will know you are my disciples. When we were there on Friday night and Patricia was sharing, I, you know, those who were there realized these are disciples of Jesus Christ because of the love they showed to another sister and brother in Christ. That was so beautiful. That is what the church is all about, to be the family of God that loves unconditionally, no matter the price, no matter the cost. You're part of the family. We love you. We, you know, we want to do this to every single person and the, the ever God brings into this family, that we would all, this is not just meant for the leadership, it's meant for every one of us, that we all love one another, even as Jesus has loved us. Amen. Father, I just come right now and, Lord, we just tell you, Lord, how much we desperately need your spirit to do this. Lord, I can't wait to be tested on this myself. Um, help me to pass. Lord, help all of us, Lord, to love others like you have loved us, Lord. Lord, would you expose into our hearts Lord, selfishness, pride, jealousy, selfish ambition, unhealed wounds, Lord, that are causing us to judge and to criticize. Lord, would you expose to us thinking patterns that have been established in our minds, even going back to childhood and the way we were raised, when we didn't know what love really look like, and it developed thinking patterns that are not love, that are more of the way of the world. Would you expose those things, Lord, so we could see thinking patterns, mindsets, strongholds, Lord, not necessarily even demonic, even soulish strongholds, thinking patterns that have been established because of the lack of love we may have experienced growing up, Lord. Would you show that to us where we've experienced, Lord, rejection and pain and the fruit that is now coming out that we didn't even know was a result of not receiving love even when we were younger. Wounds and rejection, criticism that we received growing up. Lord, even not even just growing up, even now. Lord, would you show us those things, God, that have affected us that hinder and obstruct our ability to love one another as Jesus has loved us. And so, Lord, I just pray right now that you would baptize us afresh with the love of God, that we would experience your love for us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm praying right now that we would know the length and the width and the breadth and the height of the love of Jesus Christ for us, that we might be filled up with all the fullness of God, I pray, and overflow from the love of God to others, that we could truly love others like you have loved us, Jesus. That is when we have become Christ-like, is when we love others the way you have loved us. Give us the grace and the power, Lord, to love others in truth and not with just words. Lord, let us love others by a life laid down and sacrifice, not just superficial. Lord, let us love others, Lord, 
selflessly, not selfishly. Lord, would you show us by the two-edged sword of your word those thinking patterns and mindsets that are of the soul that are hindering us from loving the way you love, I pray. And we ask that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to end the online portion. God bless you. Have an incredible week. In person here. Let's, let's wait on the Lord for a second. Just stand up for a second. Lord, I pray that you would show us the leading of the Lord right now, Holy Spirit. Dad, did you have any sensing? Where's your discernment?